I'm a little bit nervous about it because I don't think I've ever given a talk where the book I'm talking about is in the hands of the audience as I speak. So I guess I'll forgive you preemptively if at the end of the talk you're like, yes, but on page 72, paragraph 3, don't you say blah, blah, blah. Um, but uh, thank you again all for coming out on this alternately horrid and wonderful London day. So um, let me just jump right into uh, some of the ideas in the book. And uh, to lead off, I just want you to hold in mind a fact that is little known but true about North Korea. The FM radios there, by law, must be built so that they can only be tuned to one of three stations. The Kim Jong-il Party Hour, the Kim Il-sung Reflection Hour, and Rhythm and Blues. <laughs> and that's it. You're not allowed to have a radio that can tune in other stations. And that's why in South Korea they have this idea of building a, uh, having these uh, FM transmitters that are of the standard variety, solar powered, and then floating them across the demilitarized zone so that people in North Korea might have a hope of getting stations other than the ones the technology mandates that they can receive. So just hold that in your mind because I think it helps anchor at the very far end one vision for a past, present, or future of technology. So with that, let me tell you a little bit of what I see as the relevant history of information technology. It goes in two arcs that are in parallel, from what I call sterile technologies to generative ones. And when I talk about sterile and generative, and you'll soon know what I mean by that, I don't mean to say one is good and one is bad. I'd say one is good and one is better, maybe. I'm a fan of the generative technologies, but there's also a place for sterile. But in this history, what I see is not always balance but a possibility that one can end up predominating over the other. So let me give you some examples of sterile technologies from the past. This is Herman Hollerith. In 1880, he was a clerk at the United States Department of the Census. It was his job to help count how many people there were in the United States. This is a terribly boring and time-consuming job. Seven and a half years in 1880, dangerously close to the 10-year interval at which the census was run. Hollerith got an idea of how to make the count go faster. He was inspired by, on the left, a jacquard loom, and on the right, a simple train ticket, where here the holes could tell the machine where to put the threads, and here the holes could say what the privileges or restrictions were on the holder of the ticket. With these inspirations, he came up with a simple punch card that could be used by interviewers for the census as they talked to citizens, punching holes to indicate various answers to questions. You then put the card into this, Hollerith's automatic tabulating machine, and with it, you could do the count, he thought, much faster. The United States government agreed, and they were used in the 1890 census, reducing the amount of time it took to two years. Now, Hollerith wasn't just a genius technical guy, he was a pretty good entrepreneur. He rented these machines to the US government at $50,000 per machine per year, at a time when the US dollar still meant something. <laughs> It also meant, as part of this model, that because the government and later banks and railroads were renting these solutions from Hollerith, it was his job to make them work. No excuses. If something went wrong, it was Hollerith's responsibility to set it right. And that was a responsibility he took seriously. That ethos of renting the technology and then controlling it so that you're the one with whom the buck stops if something goes wrong illuminated not just Hollerith's automatic tabulating machine company in the late 19th century, but it ended up merging and changing its name, and in fact it became International Business Machines. And after a brief foray into the sale of Browning semi-automatic rifles in the early 20th century, IBM returned to the business of business. And this card is the direct ancestor of this card, the computer punch card that would go into stacks like these and then get it fed into machines like these the IBM System 360. This was a general purpose computer. Depending on what was on the cards, it could do any calculating task. However, you can tell from the way it looks. This is a machine that says, if you come near me, I will kill you. <laughs> right? This is not meant to be in your house. It's in the basement of a big firm that rents it, and men in lab coats run interference who work for IBM between the customer and the machine. And in that sense, I call it a sterile technology because while it is highly useful and effective, it's not going to surprise you. You can't reprogram it on a whim. You carefully mark out the time on it. You decide ahead of time with a committee what tasks it will do and carefully structure 
its programming accordingly. So powerful technology, but sterile. Another example of a sterile technology, the Frieden Flexor Writer. I don't know if anybody has had the honor of using one of these. Here's a version from World War II. It's like a royal typewriter, except it has this place along the left where you can thread a tape. And as you type, not only did the stuff appear up here, but it makes holes in the tape. And then later, you can thread the tape back through again. And like a player piano, it'll type whatever was on the tape. Cut up the tape and paste it together again. And you can actually do a mail merge more easily than you can with Microsoft Word. <laughs> Highly effective appliance, great technology, but sterile. There's nothing you can do to change the way it works. It's designed by Frieden to work a certain way, and that's the way it works. And it had its own descendants as well. Here it is after getting bought by Burroughs in the 60s and 70s, ultimately leading to the brother smart word processor of the 1980s and the tethered mobile phone, which can't easily be reprogrammed to destroy it if it rings at an inopportune time. <laughs> So the brother smart word processor might have written a term paper on this. It's pretty cool. Here's its main menu. Anything you might possibly want to do with your appliance, ready from brother. Brother decides what options are here and what they will work. Of course, responding to market forces. It's not like they're evil. This isn't big brother. This is little brother. But still, if you have some whimsical idea of how this machine might operate, there's no way to give it a whirl without consulting with the vendor. That makes it a sterile technology, unlikely to surprise us. This all changes in 1977. 77 was a crucial year, in my view, for the future of consumer computing and internet. Images from that era are fuzzy, but... <laughs> and also a little washed out. I guess if we draw down the overhead spots, it ruins the recording, doesn't it? But of course, I'm ruining the recording right now by going extra diegetic on you. That was a hint that if you wanted to draw down the overhead lights, I would welcome it. <laughs> so Steve Jobs in 1977 introduces to the world the Apple II personal computer, the West Coast Computer Fair. For the first time, in one convenient single plastic molded case, you had the general reprogrammability of the IBM System 360 in something as accessible as the Freedom Flexor Writer. This computer was not intended for any particular use. You turn on the Apple II, you get a blinking cursor. Can you imagine going to all the trouble, you unpack this thing, you're so excited, it's like, ready? Blinking cursor. <laughs> it's like, huh, I've seen better television. <laughs> now, of course, if you have programming skills, the world is your oyster. 10, print hello, 20, go to 10, right? <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> or, if you know a nerd, you can have that nerd write stuff for you without having to be a nerd yourself, and you can run it. And Apple is like, whatever, as long as you're buying the computers, we're happy. That's how, within two years, Bob Frankston and Dan Bricklin could invent something called VisiCalc, the first electronic spreadsheet ever. VisiCalc ran on the Apple II. Businesses saw the spreadsheet. And businesses were like, wow, where have you been the past 200 years? They all start wanting VisiCalc, which means they all need Apple IIs. Apple IIs start flying off the shelves. Apple has no idea why. That's a generative technology. Two guys somewhere with no connection to Apple can invent something that makes their thing so useful that they have to do market research to figure out why it's so popular. That's a cool technology, not limited to the expectations, however grand or feeble, of the vendors of the hardware or of the operating system. Now, I said 1977 was a banner year. Not only was Steve Jobs introducing the Apple II at that time, but Bill Gates was uh, hard at work as well. He was getting pulled over in Albuquerque, New Mexico at a traffic stop. <laughs> what I like about this picture is, well, there's several things. <laughs> what I really like about this picture it's first that he's grinning ear to ear. He's like having the time of his life getting arrested for speeding. <laughs> and secondly, his sense of fashion has not changed significantly in 30 years. <laughs> this is the prototypical mugshot of the person that brings us a generative technology. Young, smiley, brilliant, asocial, poorly dressed. <laughs> Maybe we add on mischievous as well. And it's people like Jobs and Gates who basically brought us this 
triumph of the late 20th century, the general purpose cheap PC. This model dates from about 1993. How do we know? Any nerds in the audience? Yes, the processor speed. Here's the 66 light. Because when you're using your computer, the main thing you want to know is how fast is the processor running? Of course, there's a button next to it that if you press it, puts it in the turbo mode. <laughs> then Prince of Persia runs really fast. Of course, turbo mode means that the hamsters inside have to run extra fast to power it. And of course, I can't resist but tell you that uh, they've now invented a hamster-powered paper shredder. <laughs> you put the paper in the top, the hamster runs here, and then he lives in the shredded paper afterwards. <laughs> it just shows you that reuse is a viable alternative to recycling. And that's our government-mandated green message of the evening. Glad to have gotten past it. So that machine, whether from 77 or 93 or 2007, it shares in common this idea of you give it code, it runs the code. It doesn't care where the code came from. It doesn't care if people out there are mad that you're running the code. You give it the code, it runs the code. That's a generative endpoint of that trajectory. It's what gives rise to the off-the-shelf software movement. And not just the business model of having to get this into a store somewhere. You can release your stuff as shareware or freeware as well. And if it's popular, it takes off like crazy. Just ask Peter Tatum, a staffer at the University of Tasmania Psychology Department, who was the one who first wrote for Windows 3.1 the way for a Windows machine to get onto the internet. It, like Microsoft was too busy doing solitaire to do internet connectivity, so it fell to this Tasmanian to do it, and of course it was wildly popular. Similar trajectory from sterile to generative in the network space. This is a CompuServe main menu, circa 1992-93. And here's the grid again. All the things you might possibly want to do, lined up by CompuServe. They design the icons. They decide what will be here. And you click on these buttons, and you'll get a menu from CompuServe. Nothing evil. It's designed to be what you want. In fact, they carefully invest in and groom relationships to provide you with content. But if you're a CompuServe subscriber, and you've got content you think another subscriber might like, you have no access to this main menu. Start your own service if you think you've got a great idea, or maybe talk somebody at CompuServe in the business development office into a partnership. But otherwise, this is the service, and it's not likely to surprise you. It might be useful, but nothing particularly generative about it. Compare that with the internet. Here are three of its founders pictured for their 25th anniversary retrospective. They were younger, smilier, more asocial, and I dare say more poorly dressed at the time they were designing the Internet's protocols. Uh, it's John Postel, Steve Crocker, and Vince Cerf, classmates together at the same high school in Los Angeles. Like, they had to build an Internet club and could just go ahead and do it. And they're pictured here showing you can build a network out of just about anything, although it's troubling that the network doesn't work. It goes from his ear to his ear and his mouth to his mouth. <laughs> Somewhat unsettling that the framers of the internet can't string tin cans together. But they're crazy in other ways. This network that they designed, because they didn't have a business model, they weren't restricted by having to figure out how to make money with it. They were restricted by having no money. So the limitations of having no money, coupled with the freedom of not having to make any, greatly influenced this design that says, you know what, bring your own network to the table. We're just going to stitch them together at the edges. And if you can connect to anybody already on the internet, you're as good as on the internet. Because we don't even need to count how many people are on the internet. Just join anybody already there, and voila, the whole thing should work. More formally, it's thought of as an hourglass architecture, where there's just this very narrow little bit of protocols, internet protocol, that binds it all together. But at the bottom, it's like, I don't care what your network's made out of. Just get it to some exchange point, and it can be part of the overall scheme. And up here, it's broad, because we don't care what you're going to do with the network. We don't have a main menu. We don't have a content plan. We don't have anything. You guys figure out what to do with it. Paradoxically, that ends up generating far more content than the proprietary firms whose job was to give content to people that would be worthy of them paying for it. It's this internet that gave us hugely valuable content, far more than CompuServe could dream of, and to be sure, hugely 
I was going to say invaluable content, but that's the same as valuable. Non-valuable content like the wheel of cheese in Surrey. Has anybody looked at the Surrey cheese cam? Like total waste of bandwidth. You could just watch a wheel of cheese ripen and you have the internet to thank for that. <laughs> Their architecture was so bizarre, so informal, so trusting of other network nodes that the person you connect to is going to be willing to route all your packets that IBM as recently as 1992 was fond of saying you couldn't possibly build a corporate network using this crazy internet protocol. That's why they say that the mascot of internet engineering, if there were one, would be the bumblebee because the fur to wingspan ratio of the bumblebee is said to be far too large for the bee to actually fly. In 2006, I'm pleased to report, they finally figured out how bees fly. It turns out they flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> so you take the generative network and you put it together with the generative PC and you get the boom of the 90s. These extraordinary inventions online, many of which, I dare say most of which, were brought to you not by well-funded incumbents with venture backing looking to find an angle, but rather by poorly dressed, asocial, slightly mischievous nerds that are very brilliant looking to do something for fun. You know, it was a Swede and an Estonian who came together one day and built Kazaa, one of the major peer-to-peer -peer file networks, mortally wounding the music industry. When they were done, they were like, what should we do next? They're like, I know, let's destroy the telephone industry and the same guys invent Skype. <laughs> the same guys. Once they're done with that, they're like, television's next. They're working on Joost, J-O-O-S-T. Sometimes I think that if the publishers would just have gone back in time and killed these two guys, they would have been in much better shape. Or if somebody came up to you in 2001 named Jimbo, it was like, have I got an idea for you? <laughs> we start with seven articles, then anybody can edit anything at any time. Huh? Right, it's crazy. You should be drummed out of town if you were to invest a dime in that. But luckily, Jimbo didn't care if you invested a dime. He wasn't in it for the money. Jimbo, as you already know, is crazy. And yet, somehow, the bee flies. And for now, Wikipedia is an extraordinary human achievement. And now, so ubiquitous that I'm pleased to say it can now be found on Chinese restaurant menus. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I prefer my stir-fried Wikipedia with pimentos. <laughs> this, of course, I guess is the dish that anybody can edit. I, I have a theory about it, which I'll share in question and answer if you want to know. But basically, this is a story then of crazy generative technologies down here, the PC, the internet, and internet protocol, giving rise to an ability for somebody like Jimbo to come up with something generative at the content layer, an encyclopedia that anybody can contribute to and edit that improbably actually works, and even way up to the social layer. Anybody ever use couchsurfing.net? Couchsurfing.net solves the age-old market failure. Pairing up people who are visiting a strange city and would like a couch to sleep on for free with people who live in strange cities that have empty couches and are eager for a stranger <laughs> to sleep on them. <laughs> who would have thought? And yet, couchsurfing.net is going gangbusters. People are sleeping on each other's couches. <laughs> now, if this is the first time you've seen it, I wouldn't blame you if the first question on your mind was, how many people have died using couchsurfing.net? <laughs> That's a good question. So far, the answer appears to be zero, although it's fair that successful couch surfers are those who live to tell about it. <laughs> this gives hint that generative technologies first crucially often rely on good faith, a good faith that through many lenses will appear certainly prospectively to be naive, and secondly, that when they get really popular and more and more people are surfing on couches, it starts to get noticed. It starts to include people who don't share the ethos of couch surfing, who expect a bed and breakfast and they're upset when it's only a couch. <laughs> or people who are looking to say, this is a great way to get into somebody's house and boost everything in it. <laughs> when that starts happening, if there's no further defense, that's the end of couch surfing. It's kind of like Burning Man was great last year, but this year it's gone all commercial sort of thing. <laughs> so this is a possible movement from generative back to sterile, and we can trace it all the way down the layers. 
I've hinted at it for couch surfing at the social layer. You can see it also at the content layer. As recently as 2005, it was sensible for Business Week to come out with a story like this. Blogs will change your business. <laughs> you may not have heard of them, but they're really important. Why haven't you heard of them? Because they start with yakkers and hobbyists. They start in that mischievous, poorly dressed backwater. For a time, blogs were about like cats, right? My favorite cat-oriented blog, cats that look like Hitler.com. <laughs> That's right, you can submit pictures of cats that look like Hitler. Here are some of the top Hitlers. <laughs> can I just say, coming home to this cat. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry if it's anybody's cat. I mean, it could be, right? That's part of the thing. But then they get serious, and you end up with things like global voices around the world. People don't have to be nerds to be able to blog what's going on, and when something happens in Burma or in Kenya, these bloggers turn out to be an invaluable source of information, ultimately stringing it to mainstream media like the BBC. But of course, as it goes mainstream, then you get the pattern where it's worth subverting. So these are some of the comments pending on my very modest blog. My blog is not about pharmaceuticals. but. A robot representing a pharmaceutical company has seen fit to leave comment after comment with link backs to its own terrible site. And the hope is that if those end up as comments on my blog, Google will later crawl my site indexing the web and see these links and decide that, wow, everybody's talking about these sites, they must be very important, and rank them high in Google. So the internet has fought back, it's invented the CAPTCHA, the squishy green word that a computer can generate in a heartbeat, but paradoxically cannot understand what it is. So then, I put this on my blog and I say, if you're going to leave a comment, you have to be a human and prove it by typing the word that you see. This works for a while, but then the spammers start using the generative internet. They start hiring people remotely to solve CAPTCHAs in real time all day long. But of course, that still costs money. So the spammers get even more creative. They set up websites containing free pornography. It really is free porn. There's one catch. You have to type the word that you see in order to get to each picture. Where do they get the image with the word that you see? From my blog, where they want to leave a spammy comment. They put the image here. You type in the word that you see. They take the answer, put it back into my blog. They leave the comment. You get the picture. Everybody's happy. <laughs> there were a Nobel Prize for evil. I would give this an honorable mention in the evil genius category. So this kind of subversion doesn't just take place at the content and social layers. It's working its way back down the layers of the technology. And we now see subversion taking place of our very generative machines that are hooked up as the primary endpoint on the internet. This graph only stops at 2003 because the incidents got so numerous they were no longer worth counting. So we will never have more data than this. It's just assumed that it's up here in the mural. When we run our machines, there's a big pile of code executing on it at all times. We have no idea what this stuff does. Some of it we may have put there, some of it may have come on when we, I don't know, asked to watch a hamster dance or something, and boom, you get another widget or another auto mount, whatever that is. If any one of these pieces of code had an extra line in it that said delete the hard drive, that's it. The hard drive gets deleted. That's a very far out on a limb place to be when any piece of code that you encounter can do that to your stuff. Or if it's not delete the hard drive, think of something more subversive. Go find spreadsheets on the machine and transpose numbers at random in them and then go back to sleep. And when you're doing the payroll three weeks later and you notice that nothing adds up, then you have a problem. Then you can't trust any of your spreadsheets because you don't know if the worm has reached them. It's getting to the point where it looks like discarded scripts from the show 24 are working into network world. Here's an account of the storm worm that is fighting back against security researchers who study it. It shuts down their internet access for daring to probe it. As you investigate, it knows and it punishes. As a result, researchers won't speak out. They're afraid. I've never seen this before. I mean, there's some literary people here, right? This is a terrible pot boiler, right? You would pass on this as a story because it's not realistic. Our defenses against this have not improved significantly since 1977. The basic idea is perimeter security. Just try to keep the bad stuff out, and you are the one that has to staff the guard tower. So 
It can be hard. Here's an email that went out to Harvard Law School faculty and staff saying that there had been a ton of fraudulent emails at the law school. You have to worry about what you click on because it could compromise your entire machine. It gives you a big pile of advice about what to do. My favorite item of which is this. Be weary of emails that have misspellings for grammar or odd characters. <laughs> I wrote back, I was like, I think I got one. <laughs> they bought me a one-way ticket to Oxford. <laughs> you see something like this, you're surfing around, and there's some issue, who knows what it is. Quick poll, how many say yes, proceed, when you get a box like this? I thought so. How many say no? Right, one guy here, another, third. How many do the Dark Horse Candidate View Certificate? All right, the nerds are like, woohoo, the certificate. It's funny because I click on that, I'm like, that sure is a certificate. I don't know what to do with it. My favorite new technology that makes the problem only worse, the Vista speech recognition hole. That's right, you go into Vista and it now has a feature where you can say open the folder instead of clicking on the folder. So you visit now a website and it just like starts playing a song and instead of the song it plays delete the hard drive. You're like, no, don't delete the hard drive. Yes, delete the hard drive. <laughs> like, wow, this is terrible. Chuck Roast, one of almost 300,000 websites for which if you visit them with the wrong browser, that's it, you're dead. Chuck Roast sells fleece and he doesn't even know it, but his site got hacked. The hacker added one line of code to the site, otherwise undisturbed. This line of code will completely compromise your machine if you have the wrong browser. Can I just say, this is an absurd state of affairs. Any security researcher or nerd that tells you like, yeah, whatever, you just have to update your browser a lot. That's insane. This is not a situation we would tolerate with any form of technology other than the historical accident of the PCs that we've wandered into. And I'm pleased we are in that zone of generative technology, but I think we have to stare this right in the face and see it for the problem that it is. It's best represented by this, the Cap and Crunch Bosun's Whistle. Surprise in a box of children's cereal in America in the early 1970s. After you've sugared up your kid, why not have her run around the house and blow a whistle for a while? <laughs> if you cover one hole of the whistle and blow, it generates a tone at 2600 hertz, exactly the tone used by AT&T to indicate an idle line. Blow the whistle, free long distance telephone calling. <laughs> Boxes of cap and crunch cereal flying off the shelves. <laughs> AT&T has a VisiCalc moment. <laughs> I guess there's a new third-party app for cereal. <laughs> Who knew? Now, of course, their network wasn't meant to be generative. It was just a telephone network. They could fix this, and they did. They made it so that no sound that a whistle could utter would control the network anymore. The internet is still in this phase. The passages that carry our emails and our files and our music and our web pages are also the passages that carry executable code delivered to our generative machines, and we wouldn't want it any other way. But then we have this problem that we have to solve. If we don't solve it, I say it means the end of the PC as we know it. We see it in corporate environments and cyber cafes, locked down PCs where you can't just install Skype if it isn't already there. We see it as people are moving, and I believe, this is contestable, but I believe not just as a complement but as a substitute to new internet appliances that raise the specter of the Frieden Flexor writer all over again. The Sky Plus box, the Blackberry, the mobile phone for the most part. Does this look familiar? Right? It's Frieden all over again. The Amazon Kindle, the iPod, the iPhone. Oh, the iPhone. CompuServe ought to sue for copyright infringement for ripping off their main menu. This is a movement back in time. And Steve Jobs makes no apology for it. In January of 07, he said, of course, you don't want this thing to be like a PC. It's a phone, for God's sake. You want it to be useful at all times. That's why I'm going to control everything. And that's why an important threat of our future, if we are not careful, will be a return to the past. But it's not just a return to the Frieden Flexor writer. It's the Hollerith model coming back, where there's actually somebody between you and the technology at all times privileged to reprogram it, even though you aren't. That's even more severe than this technology that we opened with. And I'm going to tell you just a few things about it. Two cases to talk about. One, TiVo versus Echostar. TiVo, a digital video recorder maker like Sky Plus. 
They have DVRs, people buy them. EchoStar makes satellite dish systems, they add DVR functionality. TiVo sues EchoStar for patent infringement. TiVo wins, fine, they win. EchoStar owes TiVo $90 million. TiVo then asks for more and gets it. They get an order from the judge telling EchoStar that within 30 days, they have to disable remotely the DVR functionality in all but a handful of the installed EchoStar boxes in living rooms everywhere. You thought you bought an EchoStar, but you only have it as long as EchoStar will allow you to keep it, or EchoStar might be forced to kill it. Here's the new product update. You have an Echo Brick. Imagine if your toaster, when you came down for breakfast one morning, was like, hi, you've got the winter update. You have a third slot. You'd be like, huh. <laughs> the next day, you go back down, it's like, Sorry, there was a problem with the winter update. You're back to two, but we're going to try to get it to three again as soon as possible. Then the next week, it's making orange juice. <laughs> and you're like, what did I buy? I don't know what I bought. I bought a relationship. I bought a service from some manufacturer that is giving me breakfast satisfaction. And I agree, they're just trying to give me good breakfast. They're not evil, but they're profoundly weird. <laughs> and this weirdness is starting to show. Some people may have OnStar in their cars. OnStar is a system that gives you GPS functionality and also a little thing in the rearview mirror with a microphone. So if you run into trouble, you press the help button, you say, help, help, I've fallen and I can't get up, and a woman hears your call and says, don't worry, help is on the way. Not a bad feature. So in a little known case, the FBI in the USA asked an anonymous car company that provides this kind of service to reprogram the system inside a car containing people of interest to the FBI so that that microphone simply goes on at all times. You're driving around, government hears everything, doesn't even have to go to the trouble of sitting nearby in a poorly camouflaged truck with sweat stains under their armpits. This gives rise to the appropriately named case, The Company versus the United States of America, <laughs> in which the anonymous company bravely takes on having to do this responsibility and says they shouldn't. The company loses in the district court an opinion under seal. They win on appeal on the slimmest of reads. The opinion says that because the way the FBI asked for it to be done, if the bad guys got into trouble and asked for help, it would only go to the FBI, which presumably wouldn't help. <laughs> was not a legal implementation. If you can make it, it goes to the FBI all the time. When they ask for help, it goes to the lady too, no problem. <laughs> you start to see the same thing happening with mobile phones and you realize that we have built an infrastructure of surveillance and control through our own market choices that is worrisome, unfortunate, unsettling, anxiety producing. Also found in chapter five of the book you're now holding. <laughs> so I'm not gonna tell you much about what to do about it. Yet. I think I'm going to stop here because I see we've got 16 minutes till the top of the hour and I'm going to turn it back over to Becky to lead question and answer and to hear thoughts from you. Thank you very much.